Hello and welcome to today's online dialogue hosted by Rails to Trails Conservancy's Trail Nation Collaborative. I'm Mary Ellen Poops. I lead the collaborative here at Rails to Trails and I'm your co-host today alongside my esteemed colleague Marianne Fowler, our, our senior strategist for policy advocacy. The Trail Nation Collaborative is a nationwide peer learning community that brings together advocates, leaders, and professionals from across disciplines to work together to establish and accelerate connected trail and active transportation networks across the country. To date, we have more than 6,000 people signed up for the collaborative. The collaborative provides proven tools, methods, and resources, including the Trail Nation Playbook. Combined with RTC's expertise and that of you, our network of partners across the country, we come together to find solutions to challenges and barriers, working to accelerate the development of connected trail systems in our communities. This opportunity is free and open to all. We welcome professionals and advocates in the trail and active transportation community and adjacent fields. With a very high amount of demand for today's session, we are thrilled to be joined by Christopher Dowis from the Federal Highway Administration later in the show to share his insights as the community planner for transportation alternatives and recreational trails program. This is our very first Trail Nation Collaborative event. We're excited to be offering this interactive event and appreciate your patience as we experiment with a new format. As we try different formats, we very much value your feedback so that we can be continuously improving. Due to the size of today's audience, we encourage you to engage with your peers via the chat box before we move into breakout groups. To make this easier, please update your name on Zoom to include your name, the state you reside in, and your organization affiliation. As you know, transportation alternatives can vary widely state to state, and this will help provide us all with some context as we interact today. This will also help organize everyone into breakout groups. You can see how mine is formatted at the bottom of my video. Please note that we are recording today's session for our own notes and will only be publishing a recording of the presentation portion of today. We hope that this allows us all to speak more freely in breakouts and the discussion portion as we work together to address shared challenges. Our topic for today is accessing federal funding, understanding transportation alternatives. Today, we will cover the basics of transportation alternatives, including the history of the program, what types of projects are eligible, and review resources to understand how to access transportation alternative funds. This is a one-on-one -on -one introductory session for those who are just getting to know this funding source. If you're looking to go deeper and discuss how states are innovating with their funds, I encourage you to join our next session on March 9th. That will be led by our VP of Policy, Kevin Mills, and we'll drop a link to that registration in the chat. Let's check in to see how familiar you all are with the Transportation Alternatives Program. There should be a poll at the bottom of your screen now. We've got quite the mix here, but it looks like most people are coming in at somewhat familiar. We've got a couple who are very familiar and some who are brand new to the program, it looks like. Yeah, it looks like about 40% of today's audience is somewhat familiar. That's great to see. Before we get started, let's review the structure of today's session as this is a bit different than our traditional webinars. If you decide that this topic isn't for you today, that's not a problem. Please know there will be plenty of opportunities to further engage with the Trail Nation Collaborative in the coming weeks and months. Marianne and I will spend some time providing an overview, talking about the history of Transportation Alternatives Program, how the funds can be used, and some of the recent changes passed in the bipartisan infrastructure law. After that, everyone on the call will have time to interact, discuss challenges, and work towards solutions. We'll spend about 30 minutes in breakout groups and in large dialogue, so I encourage you to participate and interact with your colleagues during this highly interactive event. I know we have a few Transportation Alternatives Grant Administrators registered for today, 
and we welcome those of you in that role to share your thoughts and observations when we return from breakouts. If you would like to do that, please just let us know in the chat. As with all of our Trail Nation collaborative activities, we want to provide plenty of time for you all to interact with each other. That means that we'll keep the chat open and encourage folks to keep their cameras on so we can all see each other. Please stay muted until we move into breakouts. While the chat is open and enabled, my colleagues on the call are filtering out questions for our large discussion group at the end. Please feel free to add questions to the chat as we proceed. If you have specific technical assistance questions for us, please follow up with an email after today's session. Finally, we'll close today's session with a very short survey. Your thoughts and feedback are crucial to the collaborative and allow us to continue to build programming that is responsive to your needs and highlights the incredible work happening across the country. Now, I'm curious to see who's with us today. Please take a moment and take this next poll at the bottom of your screen. The question is, in what capacity do you primarily engage with trails and active transportation? I'm seeing lots of economic development professionals and lots of advocates. So many of you look to be trail and active transportation professionals, and we're happy to have you here. We also have a few elected officials and public health folks on the call. And a number of folks joining us from the com from community development organizations. Thank you all so much for joining us today. With that, I'll turn it over to Marianne to get started. Marianne will spend about 10 minutes going through the basics of TA or transportation alternatives, and then we'll be shifting the dialogue uh, to the dialogue portion of today. Okay, Mary Ellen, thank you very much. Um, I am, um, I've been with this program from the very beginning. And so I'm really happy to share with y'all today uh, a bit of its history and what it has accomplished. It started out as a tiny little program, but with great outsize ambition and has really gone on to power a movement that has effectively made walking and biking essential modes of transportation in our overall pattern. Uh, last year, we celebrated the 30th anniversary of the Transportation Enhancements Alternatives Program. Uh, so to talk about its history, if y'all would take yourselves back in time in your minds to 19, the early 1990s. Um, Saddam Hussein has not invaded Kuwait yet. Dan Quayle is about to give us a lesson on how to spell potato. Uh, the railroads are literally slashing thousands of miles every year from their active rail inventory. And they're falling down into communities and communities saying, wow, what should we do with this? First of all, there was that shock of having lost their railroad service, but then other people began to look at those corridors as potential trails. And a brand, almost brand new organization, small uh, Rails to Trails Conservancy was scurrying around helping people to make that transformation of their rail corridor to uh, uh, a trail. And the barrier that everybody faced, kept coming up against was funding. There was no funding for this. And so they turned to us in DC and said, get us the funding. We can't make trails out of stone soup here, get us some funding. So we look, being a national organization, we looked to the federal budget. Uh, the resource side in the federal budget was drying up a lot. Uh, and so that didn't seem like a particularly uh, good approach. So we turned to the transportation budget, which was up for what's called reauthorization. In other words, Congress every five, six years has to reapprove the transportation legislation. And we were in that window. And we encountered a group of people who were interested in transportation reform and two very special members of the, of the United States Senate, um, Democrat, uh, Senator Moynihan, Daniel Patrick Moynihan from New York and Republican John Chafee from Rhode Island. And they very much felt that the federal aid highway system had done damage to communities across this country. That putting these interstates right down uh, Main Street in so many communities had really, although it had been helpful in terms of moving freight, helpful in terms of certain kinds of mobility, had also been very scarring 
to uh, many communities. So they felt that there was something, there needed to be some funding for communities to do what was called mitigation, mitigation to the damage done by the federal aid highway system. Uh, now, this was not a view shared by everybody in Congress, of course, but through a series of deals and uh, smart maneuvering, they were able to establish in the 1992 transportation law uh, program transportation enhancements. The 10% set aside of a larger program, and then there were eight eligible activities in it that you could use to make your community, to mitigate against the damage done to your community by that federal aid highway system. And among those options, among the eight, were uh, bi bicycle pedestrian facilities and the conversion of rail corridors and their preservation as trails. So we were on our way, not a whole lot of money, but the program was to be administered by every state DOT in the country, and they were pretty much left on their own to set up a system to do that. Well, the response from these state DOTs was not exactly, for most of it was not terribly enthusiastic, shall we say. There was sort of a, like, you gotta be kidding. We're, we're not gonna do this. Real men don't do trails, is the way I sort of came to characterize that. Uh, but we said, well, yes, you have to do this. And they said, no, we don't. I said, well, here's what we're going, what are we gonna do? What we're going to do is we're going, Rails to Trails Conservancy, we're going to track this program. We're going to identify every project and every dollar, uh, every project funded by it, every dollar. We're going to know exactly how the money was spent or not spent. And at the end of the year, we're going to publish a list that's going to have everybody's, every state's performance, and we're going to compare the states. And if you don't do well, if you don't use this program, if you don't bring these benefits to the people in your state, we're going to out you. We're going to uh, you know, give you negative and bad press. And they said, you wouldn't dare. And we said, oh, just watch us. And so that's what we did. I mean, we those first few years. But we continued to do that. And that, to this day, RTC keeps this enormous database, which now has thousands and thousands of entries in it. We can tell you, and you all can see, if you go to our resource page, every dollar that's been spent in your state for what and when, and by congressional district, which be, can be very important. So we were launched. And although there were various attempts to de-launch us through the years, we always prevailed. Uh, in uh, the next reauthorization, T21, we added four more eligible categories, which again, you can find online, but probably shouldn't bother because they've changed since then a little bit. Uh, and we added more money. Uh, and then we um, you know, built the program and built the program. In 2003, uh, I, an opponent of the program from Oklahoma, uh, actually defunded it through the appropriations process. And we fought and won a floor fight in the House for an amendment to restore the funding. And so that was very, very, uh, very exciting and very affirming of the program. Uh, and that led us into the, the next reauthorization, Safety Lou, where we got even more money. I would say it, we were really riding along and, and, and communities were using this for, for the things that made their communities more livable nicer places to be, options to walk and bike, but project sizes were still fairly small because even though the money we had, it got divided up into a whole lot of different segments, a whole lot of different uh, project size uh, uh, type funding. Uh, but we got to MAP 21, and this is like 20, 2010, 11, 12, because the Congress was having a lot of trouble reauthorizing the law. And so they kept doing extensions. Um, they said, okay, we don't really believe in this stuff. We have to have a tighter relationship to transportation. We're going to change the name to transportation alternatives. This is really, we want this to be more about biking and walking perhaps than anything else. And although those same eligibilities are there by and large, uh, the focus of the program has shifted more to walking and biking as a mode of transportation funded through this program. Uh, but we lost a third of our money in that reauthorization, too. They said, oh, you don't get that much money. Um, but we got enough to hang on, for sure. Uh, and they, again, key change there, transportation enhancements, now transportation alternatives. Uh, the next reauthorization, FAST Act, that's when we got suballocation. There were complaints from the states, or the people at the local level, that their state DOTs were not administering the program the way they thought it should be perhaps, or not being as, as conscious of urban issues and problems. And so we have a bifurcated system starting 
in the FAST Act reauthorization. Uh, and that gave us uh, this combination of state DOT administered money and lo locally administered money. So when we entered this latest reauthorization, um, we were, the program at that point had pumped about $17 billion into transportation enhancements alternatives across the country. Uh, we were riding high and, and there was sort of a, almost a tipping point that had occurred. We're now like not, not getting much opposition from Congress at all in terms of this program. It's just a question of how much money. And I remember going into a, a senior uh, Senate staffer's office and starting my pitch about how important this was and how much it had done for that state. And, uh, and she said, hold it, hold it, hold it, Marianne. You've won. You don't have, it doesn't matter what I think. You don't have to convince anymore. You have won. And that was a very special, special moment for both me and for all of us. We have won. We have, we have won at least that recognition. Now it becomes a question of how, how large and how much boat shift and all those things we can accomplish. But this is walking and biking are now a part of our understanding of transportation in this country. And if that understanding hasn't reached your community yet, use the transportation alternatives program to bring it along. So um, Mary Ellen is going to talk uh, in more depth about the changes in the latest um, reauthorization, uh, it, which we, has two names, but we'll call it Bill. <laughs> uh, but, um, I, I did want to mention one, and that's maintenance. Uh, all of these years, maintenance has not been or not accepted as being eligible for TA funding. And now it is. And I mean, we're talking 30 years now. We began these investments 30 years ago, and they're aging out. They need the attention of maintenance. And so that's a really, really important change that we have in this last, last law. And I would close by saying that I, I often muse on the transportation alternatives, active transportation, T-A-A-T. They're so inextricably, even the letters are inextricably related. Uh, and I've enjoyed making, talking with you about this. I'll be in the breakouts to talk more if you have questions. Um, it has been a privilege to have been a part of this movement and to have been a part of bringing this program to communities all across the country and making these key changes. So back to you, Mary Ellen. Thanks, Marianne. I think that it's just always great to hear that insight from you. And we've really had the ability to see how incredibly impactful the transportation alternatives and transportation enhancements, as it was previously known, has been in communities around the country. I'm going to get set up sharing my screen here to review some resources with you all. But while I do that, I would really love to take a moment to hear the impact of this program from all of you on the call today. Please share a quick note or emoji in the chat um, so we can hear from you how the program has positively impacted your community. And you should now be able to see my screen as well, which is awesome. It's great to hear this excitement. Thank you all for sharing that. And please do continue to add your questions and comments in the chat throughout today's program. This is just really nice to see. Um, on that note, you should now see our website on your screen our federal funding pages and the Transportation Alternatives Data Exchange are both really great resources from Rails to Trails Conservancy to help you understand and access TA funds. There are a number of tools here for you to explore later, but I will call your attention to the TA section of this page and the various other funding sources. Before I do that, I actually do want to stop on this. Uh, we have a great new federal funding tool to help you work through some of those questions about how, um, what programs might be worth pursuing in your community. Down here, you'll see a variety of funding sources. The transportation alternatives are obviously the focus for today. Um, and from here, you can learn more about the program and connect with resources. 
As Marianne discussed, many projects are eligible for the transportation alternatives funding at the federal level with trails, bicycle, and walking projects making up the majority. I will note that states do, um, states administer this funding. So some states have a few more restrictions in place, but in general, these are the eligibilities from the legislation. RTC also maintains the Transportation Alternatives Data Exchange or TRADE, um, which has tracked TA since the inception of the program over the last 30 years. For about half of that time, this data was maintained in partnership with the Federal Highway Administration through the National Transportation Enhancements Clearinghouse. And you'll see that through this map, as well as the trade state profiles, you can explore funding levels for each state. It's just loading up for us. So if you look at Minnesota, a great trail state on its own, you can see that the applications are open every other year or biannually, and they were open this past fall with a deadline last month, um, and you can see the full state allocation. You can also explore each state has their own trade profile, um, so you can go in here and explore a little bit more and see that in uh, Minnesota, they do heavily utilize TA or transportation alternatives funding for pedestrian and bicycle facilities. You can also find additional funding resources in the Trail Nation playbook. Um, this is the investment strategy page. This page includes many fantastic resources to help you build and implement your network's investment strategy with best practices coming to you from around Trail Nation. This is a living resource. So as we hear best practices from you all, we'll be updating this with more. Throughout the year, we'll take a deep dive into each page of the playbook through our Playbook in Action webinar series. We'll share more details with you about those sessions soon. Next up, we're going to move into breakout groups to discuss transportation alternatives and how you can fill gaps in your trail network. Before that, I want to hear of what barriers you're facing in accessing transportation alternatives funds. So you should now see our last poll for today at the bottom of your screen. Okay, staff capacity, availability of funds and competitiveness. Matching funds are right up there. This is a question that we ask a lot as we advocate for programs. It helps us better understand uh, what's happening in the field. So it does look like the availability of funds and matching funds and staff capacity are the top barriers for folks. That's really, really helpful to see. Those are such good insights. And then next, in a moment, you'll receive an invitation to a breakout group. Once in those breakouts, please take a moment to introduce yourselves. Um, and we have two questions get, to get you started for this about 15 minute breakout. The first question is, have you applied or plan to apply for transportation alternatives funds from your state DOT or MPO? And we're curious why or why not? And then with regard to updated guidance, how can you better take advantage of tra transportation alternatives funds? Again, we'll be in these groups for about 15 minutes and you can copy the questions down from the chat to get the conversation started. I do encourage folks to share their contact information with the group in the chat if you'd like to follow up for more depth later. Um, and as a quick reminder, we won't be publishing the recordings of your breakout groups or the discussion after. So we wanna encourage folks to speak freely. When we return from our groups, we'll spend a few minutes talking as a large group and we'll be asking you for any insights from today's meeting via the chat or using the raise hand function in Zoom. After that, we have some time to we have some time built in to answer questions that have come up today. And Christopher Dowles will be joining us for that. Thanks, Kelly. It looks yeah. like we've got most folks back with us. So welcome back. I got to jump into a few breakout groups and it was a lot of fun for me to hear what's happening um, in all of your communities. Um, I would love to take a moment to share 
to have you all share some insights from your breakout groups. You can either share in the chat or use the raise hand function at the top bar of your screen in your Zoom control panel um, to let us know that you'd like to speak. With so many people on the call today, we still have uh, well over 100 folks on the call. Uh, I would really appreciate if you could try to keep spoken comments to about under 30 seconds so we can get through a few people before we start Q&A with myself, Christopher, and Marianne. And don't be shy, feel free to use the raise hand function so I can see you in the participant list and unmute you if you'd like to share something from your group. Oh, people are physically raising their hands. For somebody, Oops. staff who can see someone raising their hand. Okay, I have one. Um, Danny from Rich City Rides here. Danny, I'm going to unmute you now. Oops. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I learned from Dave in our uh, session that um, one option to do maintenance on a trail is to hire locals that the city sometimes may not be able to hire. And they hired uh, high school students, teenagers, and uh, that seemed to work really well. Uh, and that's a good workaround for one of the things that, one of the issues that we have, there's a Richmond Greenway Trail, a trail that uh, Rails of Trails championed in Richmond, and the issue is maintenance. There is actually no scheduled maintenance whatsoever, and uh, with Rich City Rise, we're working on that at the moment. I think scheduling maintenance is, is something we've chatted a lot about um, across our work. Thank you for sharing that. Who else is there? Kelly, Jerry Walls had raised his hand previously. Okay. Hi, Jerry. I'm asking you to unmute now, so hopefully you get that prompt. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, my question in our group was, uh, and they didn't, had, none of them had experience with it, but uh, has anyone had uh, much uh, experience with getting the federal uh, agencies that provide funding to recognize the health care benefits as a tangible uh, match for some of their grants. And I ask it from the point of view that uh, we've had longstanding sponsorship and private donation from Susquehanna Health System and UPMC for a lot of our Susquehanna Greenway work. So it's really been beneficial and, and the local leaders here get it. Uh, the question is trying to get the feds and the, the federal programs to acknowledge that. That's a great one. Christopher, do you have any, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that one. Say that now. again, please. I, 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 I don't, I mean, my understanding, we have a health and transportation webpage. We've been supporting health and transportation for a long time. So I don't really understand the question. Okay, my question, I mean, I, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. My, my question is, does FHWA and other federal transportation partners recognize the um, health benefits of trail projects as a legitimate match? Oh, as a match. As a match. What, what do you mean? What do you, then what do well, you mean as a match? Um, as a match for helping to defray some of the uh, development costs or maintenance costs of a trail, particularly the maintenance costs. 
I don't know how that would be calculated. I really have no idea how that would be calculated. Well, donated hours. Donated hours from health care partners. This is a good, so Jerry, this is a really great question. And I mean, something that this dialogue is about for us to understand what are some of your challenges. So I'm, I'm hearing that understanding more around in-kind hours yeah. as it relates to match is something that mm -hmm. This yeah. group would like to have more clarity on. So we've okay. thank it you, to Jerry. Be documentable. Yeah. yeah, we made that note. So we'll include that in a follow up. I did want to get to um, Caitlin Yost and Caitlin, I'm giving you a prompt to unmute now as well. Hi there. Uh, I am from the state of Michigan. I work in our uh, Department of Transportation Office of Economic Development. I'm a grant coordinator here and I help administer the TAP program. One issue that we have um, had in the past is making sure that we aren't gapping out a project, you know, doing a piece on one side and then leaving something undone in the middle and picking up the project back on the other side. So with the um, introduction of being able to do maintenance projects. One thing that we've encountered is that sometimes there, you know, let's say there's 10 miles of existing trail. It's maybe 30 years old, right? It, the HMA has probably reached close to the end of its design life, if not the actual end. But so oftentimes there's a bridge in there. And so my question is, would that bridge also have to be um, have work done within the project, or could we not do work on a facility like that that has so much of a longer expected design life, so much as we would be able to show, um, you know, that the bridge is, is safe and, you know, it's in good condition? I don't see why not. I mean, come on. It's y y if you're building a highway and the bridge is fine. You repave the highway, you reconstruct the highway. If the bridge is fine, you don't have to do anything with it. That's just normal. At least my opinion. I love that answer so much, and <laughs> I'm going to quote you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't see why you would have to rehabilitate something that doesn't need to be rehabilitated. Just rehabilitate the trail. What I am going to do, though, is I'm going to look for, we actually have a blurb on uh we have a blurb on maintenance versus restoration anyway. But as Marianne Fowler said, any project, any project eligible under the recreational trails program is eligible under transportation alternatives and therefore trail maintenance, which is clearly eligible under recreational trails program is eligible under transportation alternatives. Now the states don't have to fund it. They don't want to, but can they? Yes. Uh -huh. I think what Christopher just said is such a key portion of us trying to understand transportation alternatives as a large group, that what happens at the federal level, there are further restrictions that states can apply for their own pots of funding. Um, so just keep that in mind for all of these conversations. I think I see um, Paul has, a, has his hand raised, has their hand raised. Oh, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, one of the things that came up in our group was um, Vision Zero. You know, I, we were talking about the, the stigma. I don't know, I'm sure the rest of you have encountered the stigma of the perception that trails are a recreational amenity and not an active transportation facility. And so here in Maine, um, the largest regional planning authority, GP Cog, just rolled out a Vision Zero policy. So we're thrilled because we're now linking our, our marketing and our pitch materials regarding active transportation to Vision Zero because they're inextricably linked. And we find it a lot easier for policy makers and elected officials to say, well, I don't wanna fund a trail, but it's much harder to say, I'm against people getting killed by cars. So um, I'm just gonna drop a couple links in the chat. One is visionzeronetwork.org and also a great documentary film called The Street Project that tells the story of implementing Vision Zero strategy in a very dangerous community. Thanks. Thank you for sharing that, Paul. I think that the Eastern Trail in Maine is a really great example of how trails are really critical to our transportation networks. 
Um, and that's why we're all here as part of the collaborative. So I'm looking forward to continuing that discussion. Hall of Fame winner. <laughs> Hall of yes, Fame. Yes, this past year's, yep. Mary Ellen, I have um, a question in the chat from Melissa who would like some more clarification on the funding path from FHW, uh, FHWA to the grantee. So just, I don't know, Christopher, just to make it kind of clear for folks to understand how the money gets from FHWA to the states, just so that everyone's clear on that basic part of, of transportation alternatives. Okay. Um, I believe Yvonne put the link to the guidance somewhere in there. So I'm going to look at the guidance right now because I actually have it open. The funds are apportioned is the term to the states by formula. So out of the federal money that goes to the states by formula, there is like 40 billion, I'm making up numbers, $40 billion spread among various programs, one of which is the Surface Transportation Block Grant Program. That's $14 billion. 10% of that is set aside for transportation alternatives. Of the transportation alternatives, uh, a share is made available for the Recreational Trails Program. In most states, that is administered through a state resource agency, not the DOT, although there are few are the DOTs. Um, then take the recreational trails program out, the rest of the money for transportation alternatives, 59% is made available to various, L, uh, it, it's what we, the term we use is called sub allocated. Some of the money is set aside to the large metropolitan areas with an urbanized area population of 200,000 or more. So that's like Roanoke, Virginia, Peoria, Illinois. Um, I think Fargo, North Dakota might just be now reaching the 200,000 metropolitan area uh, size. So it was right on the border. Um, anyway, so states that have uh, an urbanized area population 200,000 or more, those urbanized areas each also get a specific sum of money and they are responsible for holding a competitive grant process. Otherwise, there's also money set aside for areas in the 50 to 200,000 range, in the 5 to 50,000 range, and then small areas. And then 41% of the money, the state could choose to, through its competitive project selection process, the state can put that money anywhere in the state, and anybody can apply, whether it's a big area, small area. So uh, I'll do Virginia because I live in Virginia. So Richmond gets money, Hampton Roads gets money, Roanoke gets money, DC area gets money. The state is responsible for most of the rest of the money. There might be probably another urbanized area that I forgot, I'm sorry. Uh, but the state is responsible for selecting other areas. They have to make sure that it, the money goes to certain population areas, but that has to be selected through a competitive project selection process. So um, I will, Let's see, I will drop that direct link on how the money is sub-allocated. I will put that in the chat now and let somebody else ask or answer Thank a question. Thank you, Christopher. We see that Kieran Rowe is raising your hand. Kieran, hi, I'm gonna unmute you now. And I think this might be one of our last questions for today. But we'll have plenty of time to chat more in the coming months. Well, thanks for letting me ask a question. I, I missed the start of the meeting. And so my question was, has there been an, an, an announced grant cycle? Uh, I haven't heard anything. I'm in North Carolina, Western North Carolina, and I haven't heard anything from anybody at our state level about a transportation alternatives grant cycle to which we could apply for our rail trail project. And since I missed the beginning of this, I'm just, do you all know if we're looking at a forthcoming request for proposals on any of the levels that the a fellow just talking was mentioning, uh, will have grant funding awarded? 
I am, um, I think we're going to drop, yes, Yvonne just dropped a link to our trade website in the chat for you. On that, uh, on that website, there's a map of all of the states. You can navigate to North Carolina's. It does look like they had a grant cycle this past year. And I don't know off the top of my head that if North Carolina DOT is one of the states that does a biennial process or if they fund projects every year. A lot of states try to maximize their funds as much as possible and run cycles every other year um, so that they've got more money to play with. Um, but I would check in with, with the DOT folks there to see what they're anticipating because it looks like if they do do it every year, you're about due for an application cycle very soon. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the funds are, again, the funds are apportioned to the states. So the state is responsible for when it decides to have a project selection process, some are every year, some are every other year, some are even less frequent than that. Yeah. If you are in, you said Western North Carolina, if you are in Asheville, Asheville, I think, think is just barely large enough that it has its own project selection process for the for the correct metropolitan area it does yes yeah yeah i think okay, that thanks. was probably our last question for the day but i want to thank you all for joining us especially christopher it's been delightful to have his insights with us today uh, this is really just the first of many sessions and other events available to you through the Trail Nation Collaborative. We'll have a link in the chat to join us um, in our newsletter to catch up on other events. In a few weeks, we'll host a follow-up to this session uh, on innovations in transportation alternatives with our Vice President of Policy, Kevin Mills. We'll also be at the upcoming Active Living Conference in Bethesda next month, as well as the International Trail Summit in Reno in April. Stay tuned for upcoming other upcoming events on railstotrails.org slash trailnation or in our monthly newsletter. Thank you again for joining us today. Mm -hmm.